Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Boker Tov. Tov. Tell your neighbor Shabbat Shalom and Boker Tov. Good morning and peace of the Sabbath to you. It's good to be back from the NJAA Southwest Regional Conference that was in Irvine last weekend. Let's give it up for 101 years of messianic movement and Jewish evangelism and revival. We're just thankful that we have the leaders that we do have and Rabbi Larry Feldman and uh, Shuba Israel did just an amazing job really hosting most of their leaders hosting the conference and all of our messianic rabbis throughout the region and uh, it's just great to hang out in fellowship with the other leaders and the other members of the congregation and I'm telling you, you talk about dancing to like the 10th time, to the 10th sphere. I tell you, it's like you get all these congregations all jumping into messianic dancing. You think we sometimes get over, step on each other's feet. I mean, it's just like, it's it's amazing. It's crazy and amazing all at the same time. I won't call it Meshuggah, but it is definitely a wild time. And if you haven't gone before, you should try to go next year with us. And uh, I want to thank the, the leaders that did such an amazing job last week of making sure that you had an amazing service here. Go ahead, give it up to the leaders today. Your elders and cancer and your uh, youth and young adult rabbi, um, Eric, and which he, him and his wife are doing such a great job, and so are all our elders. And uh, let's pray for those sick and shut in that can't make it to services that, or can't get rides or maybe there's some other condition going on. Let's keep people in prayer. And if you're able to get a phone call out to those that you know and you're connected with or do a visit, please do that. And, and uh, if, you all, ever, if you ever know that someone's in the hospital, please always let us know so we can make a visit and we can do that. So very important that we uh, keep tight as a congregation. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're going to get right into the message today uh, for our Parsha Tetzaveh. And the message is called Beauty for Ashes. Can you say that? Beauty, beauty for ashes. ashes. Now, for some reason, I was like thinking this morning, I wonder, did I preach a sermon about Beauty for Ashes before? And it's possible that I have. But you know, every once in a while, you need to hear it again. Yeah. In fact, it might come as a new and fresh revelation because, of course, I didn't use any old notes. It's all fresh right out the oven. But uh, many of you have been keeping up with your six days of morning manna. Let me hear it if you've been uh, doing your devotionals. Yeah. All right, good. It helps you in process of learning what the message is going to be about because then you learned all the things that I'm focusing on and what I get out of it. And as a congregation, you get to kind of glean from that and we kind of all study together. And so today I'm going to give you some showbread, right? So we're going to have uh, a message called... Beauty for Ashes. We want to, I want to say a hearty welcome and Bruchim Habaim and Shabbat Shalom to all of our first time guests here today. We're so glad for the other Simcha Yeshua Messianic Fellowship that's uh, in West Covina that's with us today. Let's give it up for them. And any family members that are here or returning family members, if we haven't seen you in a while, we say again Bruchim Habaim. And we're going to get into the reading today or the message today that's based upon the readings of this Torah portion, Tetzaveh, Shemot, or Exodus 28, 20 through 30, 10, is what we heard this morning in the Torah service, and Yehezkel, or Ezekiel 42, 10 through 27, and the Book of Messianic Jews, or Hebrews uh, 13, 10 through 17. Are you ready for 10 minutes of Torah? Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's hear some uh, Mosaic instruction. I have a couple of verses to read for this portion, but it starts with the beginning of our read uh, in... Exodus 27, 20, it says, Also you are to command, or tetzaveh, can you say tetzaveh? Tetzaveh. You're to command B'nai Israel that they are to bring to you pure olive oil. Shimon, zaitzach, is the term for pure oil. One soft press, getting about a one or at the max, two drops of oil from every olive, making it very costly of a procedure to have this special oil for the menorah. It says it's to be, be beaten for the light. I meaning you can't crush it, you can only press it. Can't be crushed. You can crush it after to get oil for the other um, ingredients like the unleavened bread and the uh, different things that were used, even cosmetics, they would use certain oils and could do another press. But as far as the Olive oil for the menorah, it can only be pressed but not crushed because the broken particles will stop the fire of the menorah and its seven lamps. It says, the purpose for this pure olive oil beaten for light is to cause a lamp to burn continually. What's the purpose? The lamp, the lamp to burn continually. Now, if Yeshua is the light of the world and you and I are lights in this world, can we glean from this commandment and realize that not only is the physical lamp supposed to not burn out, but our spiritual lamps should not burn out. Because Solomon said, the spirit of man is like the lamp of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly, the innermost being. 
And this is what we have to realize is that our spirit man, anointed by the Holy Spirit, is like a lamp that needs the oil of the Spirit to have the fire of His illumination burning in our life. Amen. So we should not let our lamps be snuffed out. In fact, Revelation teaches us that if we're not obedient like some of the seven congregations, we will find out that God might snuff out our lamps. Right. Meaning we'll lose our illumination. We'll lose our light in a dark place. We'll walk in darkness and, sh and He'll let us walk in darkness. Mm -hmm. But if we allow the light of Messiah to shine, we become lights in this world because of the oil of the Spirit that's in our life. Do you remember the parable of the ten virgins yes. or the bridesmaids mm -hmm. at the wedding? Mm -hmm. And we actually get bridesmaids from that concept of that ancient the custom of women having these lamps that they needed to have oil ahead of time in there ready to be lit when they heard the herald say, Baruch haba, b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they would say, Baruch haba, for the groom, when he would come. And so the concept was, Messiah as a groom is coming for his bride, and we're going to hear, Baruch haba, b'shem Adonai. He's coming, he's coming, quickly, quickly. And the bridesmaids or the virgins would have to uh, light the wick of their lamp, and if they didn't have oil like the five foolish ones, then there was no oil to burn. And they wanted the wise virgins to give up their oil and give to these foolish virgins. Now, what's funny about that is you got five that are foolish and five that are wise. Mm -hmm. And there's a number of ten. And think of the ten plagues, ten commandments, ten fingers, the tenth or the tithe. And you think about our responsibility. We have to make sure that we know what our right hand is doing and what our left hand is doing, right? Because there are times where... You know, we're a little confused on what's going on. And I think that sometimes we could be doing one thing with one hand and not realize there's another hand involved. So we need to really understand the concept of the five that were foolish should not rely on the five that are wise to give up what they, through wisdom, attained. Amen. And sometimes people want to glean from your wisdom. It's okay to share, but share to teach them how to fish mm -hmm. instead of feeding them fish, mm -hmm. yeah. instead of fishing for them because they need to do it themselves. So this pure olive oil is a picture in our life of the Spirit. In the tent of meeting, it's outside the curtain or the parochet, the veil. And it says, Aaron and his sons will set it in order to burn from evening to morning. How does God count a day? Evening, evening to morning. Because it went from darkness to light. What's the purpose of the menorah? To go from darkness to light. Notice the concept of God saying, let there be light. How many lamps of fire burning? Seven. How many days before God rested? Seven. seven. So six days and then the seventh. I don't have time to go into the construction of the menorah today, but you've heard me teach about the menorah being a center shaft or vine. And then there's six branches. Three on one side, three on the other. And then the center one would become number seven. And sometimes it, it was, uh, uh, they were made to be lifted up a little higher, like a shamash candle of a Hanukkiah. And so you think about Yeshua being lifted up. He will draw all men to him. Because of the light of the Yeshua, they're drawn to him. Well, the other, the six lamps that are coming from the six branches, three on one side, three on the other, you could think of it today as Jew and Gentile and grafted into the same vine or the same olive tree. Because some were unfaithful or were removed that allowed the wild olive branch, the Gentile, to come in to what was an already Jewish tree with Jewish roots called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So think about six. Man was created on the sixth day, right? Three was the day that God gathered together in perfect unity the dry ground and make earth and gathered together the water and called it seas. Because number three means to gather together in perfect unity. Where two are gathered together in my name. Two or three gathered together in my name. There I am in the midst. So perfect unity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Spirit, Soul, and Body. We're supposed to be in perfect unity. Right? So Jew and Gentile in perfect unity in the same tree with Messiah being the vine or the tree, because he's growing from the roots of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the descendant, so the tree grows up, and you have the branches, and so it's a perfect picture of Israel, or a perfect picture of a congregation, yes. where Gentiles are allowed to come in and, and be ushpizim, guests at the table of the Jews, for every feast day, for every Sabbath day, for all nations to learn Torah. Amen. Amen. And Amen. you see it as the symbol here, the Jerusalem seal or Messianic seal. Here you have the three on one side, three on the other, making a total of six. Mankind, 
the center one, the seventh, the day of the Lord. So that's Yeshua, the center. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you spell Yeshua's name, the way it's drawn in Hebrew, you can actually six, see six flames of fire on the letters because the sheen alone is three, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, Ever see on our logo, uh, uh, our, we have the flames of fire. There's exactly seven on purpose because that's how the letters are drawn. So Yeshua's only four letters, but one letter has three. Hmm. And so you can see the letters all have flames of fire burning on top on our logo. So, important to understand how Yeshua wanted uh, us to be lights in the world the way the Father wanted Israel to be a light in this world. Okay? Now, uh, let's move on. That was a long part, wasn't it? Uh, the main thing I want to talk about is what's in chapter 28, verse 4. These are the garments they are to make. A breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a tunic of checkered work, a turban, and a sash. They are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron and his son, so that he may minister to me as a Kohen, and they are to use the gold, the blue, the purple, and the scarlet and fine linen. So I want you to notice these special garments uh, that, actually I went to verse 4, but I want to show you what the purpose of the garments are for in verse 2. It says in verse 2, you are to make holy garments for your brother Aaron for what? Splendor. Splendor and beauty. It's actually in Hebrew, kabod, glory, and tifaret. Um, tifaret is beauty, or it's translated splendor. So it's really for glory and for beauty. Remember that Adam was clothed or crowned with glory and honor. And when he sinned, someone like Adam had to come and be crowned again with glory and honor. Guess who the last Adam is? Sure. Yeshua the Messiah. He was made like Adam before the fall so he could fight the three temptations that Adam fought, but in the wilderness, like Israel. And Yeshua passed the test while Adam failed the test. So Adam lost the dominion. Yeshua regained the dominion. The first Adam all die. The last Adam all live. Amen. So a perfect picture of how God wants all mankind to come back into the glory and honor that he crowned Adam with to be a king and a priest, to have dominion over all the fish of the sea, follow the air, and over every creeping thing, even the sun, moon, and stars, which are the work of his hands. He says in Psalms 8, that's what he wanted Adam to have. Now, when man failed, God says, well, let's see if I can find one person that would be willing to accept this. Guess who we found? A man of faith by the name of Abram, who became Abraham, or Avram, who became Avraham. A father of a multitude, he became. Av Hamon Goyim. Now, this is what's important to understand about the role of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were supposed to raise up a family in the earth, a tribe of people that would become a nation. He says, I'm going to basically make a nation out of you. And you'll be a father of other nations. So God chose one out of many, or one out of 70 sons of Noah became 70 nations. And God says, I'm going to bless you to be a blessing. And through you, all the families or all the nations of the world will be blessed by you. All Gentiles owe their blessings to Abraham and his descendants. Amen. Oh, you don't believe me, do you? No. Well, think about Romans tells us. To them, he gave the sonship. Right. He gave the glory. He gave the covenants. He gave the promise. He gave the patriarchs. He gave us Messiah. He gave us all these blessings. There's actually eight blessings. He gave us the Torah. He gave us divine worship or service in the temple or the tabernacle. He gave us eight glorious things through the Jewish people. The word of God was given through 66 books by 66 authors, and I believe they're all Jewish, even Luke. Amen. You can talk to me later about that one. <laughs> Good Jewish doctor. And I believe that God entrusted the Jewish people with a gift to humanity. That the glory would come through Israel. That the Messiah would come through Israel. That the divine worship service would come through Israel, including the priestly worship. Because divine service, avodah, means divine service or worship through the priestly sacrifices that would go up. God painted a picture through the tabernacle how we could draw close to God with a draw close thing called an offering, a korban. From the root karab, to draw close. So when you bring an offering, it's, it's something that enables you to draw close. Think about what we did today. We brought our offerings for the month of Adar. What allowed you to draw close to the, to the Sadaka box? You had an offering to bring. What would have happened if you didn't have an offering? You would probably sit where? Back in your seat. So 
It was a vehicle by which it caused you to draw close because you had something to give. Amen. You know the beauty about going to somebody's house when you bring a housewarming gift? You're excited about going because you're not just coming to receive, you're coming to give. And it used to be an ancient custom that I wish we'd bring back. Always bring a housewarming gift. Doesn't matter how many times you've been there. I brought you a gift. I brought you flowers. I brought you... Bring a bottle of Merlot if you like. I don't care. Just, you, whatever it is, whatever that gift was, it might be chocolates, it might be whatever, it could be dessert. Or it might be grape juice, you can do grape juice too. But, you know, you sure definitely did not drink grape juice, he drank wine. The reason we know he drank yine, yine is wine, is because they rebuked him for being a wine bibber, not a grape juice drinker. The problem is, in our world today, we abuse it so much that we can't even reconcile in our minds that Yeshua, who was sinless, drunk, drunk wine. I thought wine was sin. No, drunkenness is sin. But they also called him a glutton. So drunkenness and gluttony are in the same category. If you're pointing the finger at someone with an alcoholic problem or addiction, be careful that we're not also addicted to other things. You could be addicted to anything which would then be sin for you because it's obsessive. But when we think about God giving Israel the priesthood, God was saying, I want to teach the nations of the world what it's like to draw close to me again through this sacrificial system. So God says they have to be for glory and for honor. Now, I'm going to move on to the Haftarah, because I need to get off my soap, soap, soapbox. And uh, let's take a minute, uh, so 10 minutes for Haftarah. You ready? Yes. yes. That is the prophetic precepts of the prophets. So I'm going to take you through uh, to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, it, it says in the TLV or Tree of Life version, the Ruach, which is the spirit of Adonai Elohim is on me or upon me. Because Adonai has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the what? Brokenhearted. Now think about the anointing here. We just talked about the anointing oil. And then we talked about the garments. I want you to keep this in context. We talked about the anointing what? oil, and then we talked about the priestly garments. Keep those two in mind. So he says, because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor, he sent me to bind the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty, literally jubilee, to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those that are bound. But he says in verse 2, to proclaim the year of Adonai's favor, that literally is again referring to jubilee, and the day of God's vengeance, but watch this, to comfort all who mourn. mourn. To console those who mourn in Zion, Jerusalem. To give them beauty for what? Ashes. Ashes. And the oil of joy for what? Mourn. Mourning. Notice mourning has shown up three times. Yes. Comfort all who mourn. Console those who mourn in Zion. And then uh, specifically, <laughs> he gives you an oil of joy. An oil of joy. An oil of joy. What did we start with? They brought this precious, pure oil for anointing and for lighting. And so we have the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of what? Heaviness. heaviness. Think about people that are in mourning. They're in heaviness. That they might be called the oaks or the trees of righteousness, the planting of Adonai, that he may be what? Glorified. God gets glory out of turning a mourner into a worshiper in turning a, a, a mourner with heaviness into a praiser. God gets glory of taking our ashes and turning them into beauty. Now, some of you might remember that quite a few Shabbats ago, years ago, I actually showed you the Hebrew of this verse. I'm going to actually go to verse 4 and show you the end result of this, and then I'm going to show you a commentary that actually sh shows what I taught years ago on this verse, and I probably haven't shared it in a while. So in verse 4 it says, they will what? Rebuild, Rebuild the, ancient. the ancient ruins. Remember the prophet reading today? That it says that you have to remember this pattern, this blueprint, this diagram, this teaching of the, the temple. Because we talked about the building blocks, how the Torah and how the, the, the prophets and all of the Tanakh, they all give us a blueprint of how to build our lives as a house of God as a congregation of people, as priests of the Lord. We're living stones in a habitation where God can dwell in, and we're offering up as spiritual priests, spiritual sacrifices, because we're a royal priesthood. That was Israel's original calling in Exodus 19, 4 through 6. Amen. And 1 Peter 2, 9 brings the Jew that is in the diaspora 
thrown out into the nations, back to their calling to be this priesthood. So look what it says. They're going to rebuild the ancient ruins. They're going to restore former what? Desolation. desolation. They will repair the ruined cities, desolation of many generations. Strangers or foreigners or Gentiles will what? Stand and shepherd your flocks. Children of foreigners will be your plowmen and vine dressers. Okay. Now, in verse 6 it says, But you will be called the what? The Kohanim, or priests of Adonai. Notice the concept. In the Torah, we read about the priesthood, the garments of the priests, and the oil that they were to bring for the tabernacle. They will speak of you as the ministers of our God. You are to eat the wealth of Gentiles, nations. In, in Hebrew, goyim. In Greek, ethnos. We get the word ethnic groups. So you will eat the wealth of the nations, meaning the nations will pour in their resources to you. You know what's happening with Israel right now? Nations that feel a call and organizations that feel a call to Israel are pouring in their resources to Israel right now. And their Israel is rebuilding from the ground up, from the rubble. Yeah. Uh, it says, you will eat the wealth of nations and boast in their abundance. <clears throat> Look at verse, I'm going to turn down to verse 10. Tying this together. Remember, you've anointed me, right? Mm -hmm. And you called me a priest. And you took off the ashes. And you've put on beauty. And now we're going to even see further what that priestly ministry represents. In verse 10, it says, I will rejoice greatly in Adonai. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he has clothed me with what? Righteous. Garments salvation. of salvation. He has wrapped me in a robe of righteousness. <laughs> like a bridegroom wearing a priestly turban. Like a bride adorning herself with her jewels. Now remember, I just referenced the five foolish virgins versus the five wise ones at the wedding feast that was a parable of Yeshua coming back as the groom. Look at this rejoicing that should happen. The man should be like a bridegroom. The woman should be like a bride adorned for her husband. So he says, I'll cause you to rejoice once I put on garments of what? Salvation and a robe of what? Righteousness. Righteousness. Now, I want to show you in Gill's exposition of the Bible. I go to BibleBrowser.com or Bible Hub to get this commentary. You just click on comment and you can find this uh, commentary. It says, in reference to the words, to give them beauty for ashes, the name of the sermon today. What is it? To give them beauty, beauty for, for ashes. ashes. It says, in the Hebrew text, there is a beautiful play on words which cannot be so well expressed in our language. Why is it important to know your Jewish roots? Why is it important to understand the Hebrew? It's because there are certain things in the Hebrew tongue that cannot be expressed very well in English. And you will read this a million times and just think it's poetic words. Oh, beauty for ashes, beauty for ashes, beauty for ashes. How many actually have a historical context in the back of your mind or a working knowledge of scripture on what the purpose for ashes were? Has anybody you know, thought about the deeper meaning of this beauty for ashes? As well as you could probably jog your memory in English when you see the word beauty and ashes in English, in the, in, the, in the English text, it will never compare for what you'll see in the Hebrew. Never. And let me give you the rest of this commentary. It says, to give pe'er for efer. Pe'er for efer. So we have pe'er tachat efer. Literally, un the word tachat meaning under. So we have this term, beauty for ashes, the word for beauty, is pe'er, and then it says for ashes, efer, okay? And the purpose, it says, in times of mourning, it was usually to put on sackcloth and ashes. They'd take a sack, mm -hmm. you know, that you'd carry stuff in, put a sack on, and, you know, cut a little hole in there, just like, you know, you know that's like sack races where you pull it this way. <laughs> but put a sack on this harsh, rough material, <laughs> and when they were pe feeling pain and sorrow, they, they, they didn't want soft clothing. On. They wanted sackcloth, not soft clothing, but sack clothing. Clothing that felt hard and rough because that's the way their life felt. And they put the sackcloth on it and then they would just take ashes and throw all over their head, all over their body, and they would look like trash or rubble or something that was just destroyed because that's the way they felt internally. So they would dress themselves externally the way they felt internally. Okay? So if we take a look at that, it says as found in Esther 4.1, um, goes on to say, instead of this, Messiah gives us his mourners, 
excuse me, Messiah gives his mourners the beautiful garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness and the graces of his spirit and his gracious presence together with his word and ordinances and sometimes a large number of converts, Kill writes. Goes on to say, all which, as they are ornamental, meaning an adornment to his people, they yield them joy, peace, and comfort. This is a beauty that is not natural to them, but is of grace, not acquired, but given, not fictitious, but real, it is perfect and complete, lasting and durable, and desired by Messiah himself who gives it. Now that's a great, you know, it's a, it's a Christian commentator, he's drawn from the Hebrew, but I want to go back to the Hebrew because he couldn't even explain what the play on words was. Now, let me give it to you. Let's go back. I want you to see the Hebrew letters here. Does anybody from Hebrew class know what that letter is? Hey. hey. It's a picture of a what? Mouth. Mouth. And Aleph is a picture of a? Oxen. Resh is the picture of a? Head. Which means first or beginning. Now, there's the word tachat, which means to be under, like Israel was under the glory cloud at Mount Sinai, like a, like a bride mm -hmm. waiting for her groom to say, I do. Now, notice the letters here. What's this letter? Olive. Olive. Oh, we had that already. Yeah. <coughs> letter what? <coughs> Pei. And the letter? Reish. So here you have Pei, which is a mouth. You have the Olive, which is an ancient pictograph of an ox head. And then you have a Reish. So notice that it's the same exact letters for both words. So the rabbis looked at this and said, how curious is this? Because in the Hebrew tongue, you would only see it in Hebrew, that it's the same letters or ingredients that make up ashes that make up beauty. So God who creates with the Hebrew alphabet, 22 letters he created the world. Amen. It's interesting, when you take 22 divided by 7 days, you get 3.14 roughly, which is like pie, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not this kind of pie. <laughs> and you think how, how God created the circumference of the universe, the circumference of the earth, mm -hmm. through 22 letters over seven days, he created that circumference. Wow. And pie is used to measure that. Wow. And so, <laughs> that's just a little tidbit there. But what I want you to see is God will take your ashes and turn it around. They used to sing in church, turn it around, open the windows of heaven, pour out a blessing, overthrow, turn it around. Now, that's not the one I'm thinking of, though. There's another song that goes back a little further. <laughs> Late in the midnight hour, God's gonna turn it around and around and around. And, oh, don't make me go there. I have to get this song <laughs> But late in your midnight hour, when you're mourning and you're crying and, 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 and you, you feel completely just overwhelmed and your head and your mouth and you're frustrated with words of, why me, Lord? Why me? Oy vey, oy vey. God turns the letters that used to spell ashes and he moves the letters around in a different order because God doesn't always change your situation, but he does change your perspective of your situation. And so if he can get you to see the letters or the ingredients of your pain to change around for praise, then in the midst of your pain, you'll praise him. In the midst of your mourning, you'll worship him. In the midst of your exile, you'll cry out to a God that can free you and set the captive free. Because God says, I'm going to anoint you to set the captive free. I'm going to anoint you to be a priest. See, that what the priest does, he goes in as a mediator, and he takes a negative situation, and he hears from God, he says, this is what God says. And then he takes the cry of the people and says, God, this is what the people are saying. And just like the prophet Moses, and just like Aaron the priest, they were mediators to turn situations around with the enemy meant for bad, God can turn it around for the good. God will take the same ingredients of your ashes, of your sackcloth, and your pain where you feel like you're dead, like ashes. We always say, you know, from the dust we came, from the dust we return. And sometimes when people say, is it okay to have a cremation? I say, well, we're all going to get to ashes eventually. So I really don't, you know, I probably, I probably want a casket, but I mean, for people that have been cremated, I, we're all going there someday. Unless Yeshua comes back before that day, and then we will all be brought back to our glorious body that we want so and so desire. So notice what God does. He gives you to air for effort. And that's not the, the, all of it. The word to air, translated beauty, is not really beauty. But it is a beautiful thing. 
It's an adornment that you wear. So the beauty is something you put on. Say put on. Put on. Now, let me show you where it shows up in the text. We go back one slide. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God, for he's clothed me with what? Garments. Garments. What did he give the priest? Garments. Garments. He gave him a robe or a tunic. What did he give us? We gave us a robe, too. And he goes on to say, like a bridegroom wearing a priestly what? Turban. Turban. That's why the man becomes the priest of the home and he gets married. He's lifted up in Jewish weddings on a, on a, a throne with the wife. She's, ki- he, she's queen, he's king. But there are also priests unto the Lord. So kings and priests. So that's why there's so much celebration at a Jewish wedding. And they hoist them around. And if you think about the priestly turban, it's a head garment that the priest would wear. Like a yarmulke. So it was a priestly covering, a head covering. And Jews wear them as a covering over their heads because God is the glory over our heads. He's also the glory and lifter of our heads. So in the midst of our mourning, he says, get out of the muddy book. Take those old garments of the sackcloth off. Put on priestly garments. But watch this. The Hebrew word for turban there is pe'er. The translator decided to call one beauty and the other one a turban. It's the same word. I'll give you a head covering for the ashes you've been putting on your head. Stop throwing ashes on your head. Take those ashes off and start putting a a garment over your head. Put Put a head covering over your head that represents my glory. For I'm the glory and lifter of your head. Now, this is the amazing thing about this teaching that if we go into... Esther, as they told us to, Esther, for one, we see when Mordecai learned all that was done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went out into the middle of the city, crying out in a loud and a bitter voice. He went also as far as the king's gate, because no one could enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. No one can enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. No one can enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. See, sackcloth and ashes means you're outside the gate. You're mourning because there's no city, no temple, no... But when there's a city, and there's a temple, and there's a kingdom, and the king is worthy to be praised, guess what? You've got to take off your sackcloth. You, can, you cannot come into his courts with sackcloth and ashes. You've got to come into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You've got to put on the garment of praise with the spirit of heaviness because we can't stay heavy that long without getting depressed. And God says, I don't want you in depression. I want you to make an impression, not have depression. The only way to make an impression is to praise me in the midst of your pain. If you're the only one in the jail, shackled with other people, praise and sing praises like Paul and Silas. And eventually your shackles will have to come off because your, your, your pain will have to match your praise. Because your praise will bring you out of your pain. Now, look what it says. It says, uh, verse 3, in, in each... And in every province where the king's edict and law came, there was a great mourning among the Jews. With fasting, weeping, wailing, many put on sackcloth and ashes. It's interesting that what you do, others will do, and then will follow you. Mm -hmm. Now, in this sense, the sackcloth and ashes was a form of prayer. And I'm going to show this to you in the next verse in the book of Daniel. Because in Daniel 9.3 it says, So I set my face to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and supplication and fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So there is a place for this reference of sackcloth and ashes, but it's for prayer. Not just for mourning the destruction of the temple. See, when Daniel saw throughout, through the window, when he saw that there was, um, his city was burned, he would pray out his window three times a day. And they were in exile because the Babylonians had destroyed Jerusalem. Do you remember Nehemiah? Mm -hmm. Nehemiah also looked and wept when he saw Jerusalem, that it was burnt down to the ground, like the rubble, like the ashes. And so that was a time to pray. When it's burnt down, it's time to pray. But if you want to build it up, it's time to praise. Say that again. If it's burnt down, you need to pray. But if you want to build it back up again, you need to praise. Because you can't just put on sackcloth and ashes and enter into the king's gates. They won't let you in. So you've got to take those garments off. So there's a time to pray, and then there's a time to praise. 
I always find that your prayer should end in praise. Amen? Amen. Uh, look what Ezekiel 24, uh, 23 says in reference to the Babylonian exile. It says, your turbans will remain on your heads. Wow. On, and, on your, on, uh, and your shoes on your feet. You will not lament or weep, but you will pine away in your iniquities and groan to each other. So he was saying, while you're in the midst of this exile, you're going to be there because of your own iniquity. He says, but don't weep. Keep your, keep your turban on. In other words, don't lose hope. You're there because of your iniquity. But if you praise me and you seek me and you look for me, instead of weeping, you can fast and pray and believe that God will bring you out. Because Jeremiah prophesied only 70 years. And so eventually, you're coming out of this thing. There is a set time to favor Zion and to bring you out of your turmoil. Now, uh, one last passage here, and then we'll go to the Brit HaShah, and I'll close. Now, look at Zechariah 3.1, Zechariah, or Zechariah 3.1. It says, Then he showed me Joshua, or Yehoshua, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, standing for Adonai. Here's another reference to a priest. The priest during this time uh, was Joshua. It says, before the angel of the Lord and the Satan, literally Hasatan, the adversary, standing at his right hand to accuse him. So really, Satan is not his name. It's his title. He's the adversary. Mm -hmm. The word devil is not his name either. It's the accuser. Yes. We don't actually give him a name anymore. Right. He had a name. Lucifer. Well, that's the Latin, Lucifer. Right. But Ben Shahor, he was the son of the dawn, and he was Hallel, the one who brought praises to God. Hallel, hallelujah, praise. He lost that place of praise. You and I regained that place of praise. He was supposed to be the one that offered the praises when, when the dawn, when, when the sun would rise, the praises would rise. And if you notice that angels go on shifts, remember the one that wrestled with Jacob? He says, it's my time is up, the daylight's breaking. I gotta go. The next shift is coming down. Think about Jacob's ladder. Angels were ascending and descending. Why? They're coming on shifts. Because when the praises go up, the blessings come down. Amen. When the prayers go up, the answers to prayer come down. You better know your angels are running on shifts to make sure that he can keep you in all of your ways. When one's like, okay, I'm done, I'm tired of wrestling. Somebody else come and take care of this joker. No, I just uh, this is important that we realize that God has a plan for us. Even in the midst of our pain and our exile, God will bring us out. Look what he says to Joshua in reference to the whole nation, because the priest represented the nation. Adonai said to the Satan, or Hasatan, Adonai rebukes you. You don't need to rebuke the devil. You just say the Lord rebuked you, because his power is greater. It's not your power that rebukes him. It's in the name of the, of the Messiah of Israel that he is rebuked. Indeed, Adonai, who has chosen Jerusalem, chosen who? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Rebukes you. This is not, okay, is not this a man, um, excuse me, is not this man a brand plucked out of the fire? Wow. Instead of having him burn up, he's been plucked out. How many of you have felt like you've been plucked out of the fire before? In the midst of a fire, a fiery temptation, God just plucks you out. Look, look at verse 3. Now Joshua was wearing what? Filthy garments and standing before the angel. You know why the enemy likes to accuse us? He's pointing out our garments. And sometimes our garments do get stained. Maybe not always with sin, but sometimes just dealing with the world, we get stained. We get down, we get depressed. And how many know when, you don't, when you're not dressed well, you don't want to talk to anybody, you want to look at anybody, but when you look good, you're like, oh, let's go someplace. Like, I look good. You get excited. In fact, they say the clothes make the man. Well, if we wear the right clothes, we'll wear the right one that we're meant to wear. We're not meant to wear depression. We're not meant to wear uh, confusion. We're not meant to wear uh, uh, lack or disappointment. We're meant to wear garments of praise and salvation. I love what it says here, and this relates to this uh, idea of beauty for ashes or a turban for the sackcloth and ashes. It says, then to Joshua he said, see I have removed your iniquity from you. Just throw your hands up if you're thanking God that he's removed your iniquity from you. I'm not even talking about your sin. Your sin was your rebellion to willfully choose to do something outside of God's will. But the iniquity is why you did it. God says, I'll remove the iniquity of the heart. Sin is of the soul, transgressions of the body. So I'll remove the iniquity, the evil desire away from you where you won't want it anymore. Yes. That's what's good about God. He can take the iniquity, like the iniquity in the heart of Lucifer or uh, Hallel, the fallen angel. He can take it out of a believer 
when we give it to him, he'll remove the iniquity. Look what it says. And dress you with fine clothing. Then, I said, place a clean what? Turban. Turban, Turban on his head. Give him beauty for ashes. See, the city of Jerusalem had been destroyed, and they were rebuilding. And it was so sad that it wasn't as glorious as Solomon's temple. He says, no, you don't understand. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Because the latter house will be more glorious than the former house. He says, so put a pure turban on his head and clothe him with garments while the angel of Adonai stood by. Notice the angel of the Lord is standing by like a guard to protect Joshua against the accusations of Hasatan. Many other afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Think about what the scripture says of you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Think of also how we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and the word of his te our testimony. So there's an angel of the Lord standing guard to make sure that the accusations of the enemy do not put stains on your garment. While the angel of the Lord stood by, the angel of Adonai exhorted Joshua, exhorted Joshua, saying, Thus says Adonai Sevaot, the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you will judge my house, watch over my courts, and you will give, I will give you a place to walk among these standing here. Listen well, Joshua, Kohen Hagadol, or Kohen uh, High Priest, both you and your companions seated before you, because they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. You know one of the greatest signs of the text? The name of the Messiah is in the text. Joshua, the high priest, not Joshua, the servant of Moses, Joshua, the high priest here, he is a sign of who the Messiah would be and even what his name would be. Because Yeshua is our high priest. And he says this is going to be a sign to show you who the branch would be. His name will be Yehoshua. Or in Aramaic form, Yeshua. And that's one of the signs of the text. And Isaiah, I close with, this will take us right into the Brit HaShah. Look at this. It says, awake, awake, Isaiah 3.1. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments. O Jerusalem, look who he's talking to, the holy city. For from now on, there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Now, is he just saying Gentiles can't come in? No. He's saying the uncircumcised that have come in to defile the temple by destroying it again. Like the Babylonians did, like the Romans did, those uncircumcised, like Goliath the Philistine, you uncircumcised Philistine with no covenant with our God. How dare you try to defy the armies of Israel, defy God himself. And so what the text is saying is no longer will God allow the enemy to come in and defile his temple any longer. So I'm going to close with uh, some thoughts from the Brit HaShah today. And uh, it says in Romans 13.1, remember we just read, awake, awake. Look at Romans. It seems to go right along with the Isaiah passage. Besides this, you know the time. Read this with me. That it is already the hour for you to awake from sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first came to trust. The night is almost gone, and the day is near, so let us put off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Wow. That's amazing. It connected the concept of putting something on as well as awakening out of sleep. Awake, awake. Put on your beautiful garments. Now, look what Galatians says. Galatians says in chapter 3, verse 27, For all of you were immersed. What were the priests expected to do before they put on their clean garments? They had to immerse in the labor, in, in water. That's where we get baptism from. Baptismos, washings, translated in Hebrews 9. And they translate baptism everywhere else, but it's a washing or immersion of the priests that were clean before God before going to the holy place or the holy host. It says, For all of you are immersed in Messiah, and have clothed yourselves with Messiah. Amen. So in other words, Messiah is our high priest, and we've clothed ourselves with the garments of the priest because he is our clothing. He's our covering. We clothe ourselves with Messiah. Look what Hebrews says. But when Messiah <laughs> appeared as what? Kohen Gadol, high priest of the good things that have now come, passing through the greater, more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, 
But he says he entered in the holiest, the holies once for all, the holiest of all, by the blood of goats, says, or excuse me, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. Here's the clincher, verse 13. It says, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, meaning the outward, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Now what is he inviting us to do? Serve the living God. What do the priests do? They serve the living God. So the only way is for our hearts to be cleansed when our conscience is cleansed. Now, this is the key that you see in verse 13. The ashes of the heifer were burned, or the ashes, uh, the, 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 the burning of the heifer actually gave us ashes that were used for a water purification. They would not only sanctify anyone defiled, but the temple or tabernacle itself. So it's believed that when the new temple is built, they have to have the ashes of a, this perfect red heifer to be able to do that. And uh, we're this close, guys. We're this close for God fulfilling all of his purposes and all of his prophecies for Israel to come back to the land and to experience corporate worship so that one like Moses and Elijah, or whoever you think the two witnesses are, can come and do the work they're going to do for three and a half years of the tribulation period and make all of those who still are yet to believe through the 144,000 evangelistic Jews as they go out and share the gospel with their sabras, the native born in the land, what's going to happen is there's going to be a great Jewish revival. Yes. Yes. As it started in Acts chapter 2, it will end with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Yes. 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 Because actually most of the prophecy of Joel is not fulfilled yet. The sun being darkened, the moon turning to blood, that hasn't happened all at the same time yet. In other words, that prophecy hasn't happened yet because that's going to happen in the end of days. So actually, Acts chapter 2 is a partial fulfillment of what's yet to come. Amen. What has happened will happen. Now, look what it says in Ephesians 4.17. So I tell you this, indeed I insist on it in the Lord. Walk no longer as the pagan Gentile nations do. Stumbling around in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding. This is what's prob the problem in the Gentile world is that we don't understand these, uh, this temple worship, sacrifices. We don't understand why, why Messiah had to come to the Jew first, then to the Gentile. We don't get all that. We just accept, well, Jesus died for my sins. Right. And then you have to we believe that in a couple years they fall away from the Lord. Because they never quite understood salvation in the first place. It didn't really take a, a large uh, part of their heart and, 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 and grab it. It just kind of, it just kind of a surface salvation. And what happens is that the understanding is darkened in the Gentile world, and it says the Gentiles that were pagans were alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance in them due to the hardness of their heart. Since they are past feeling or conviction, they have turned themselves over to the indecency or for the practice of every kind of immorality, the greed, and for more. Now that's exactly what the Greek and the Roman world was like. Now, obviously a Gentile and Messiah is no longer just a Gentile. He's coming to Messiah. He's been engrafted in. So look what it says in verse 20. However, you did not learn Messiah this way. If indeed you have heard him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Yeshua, with respect to your former lifestyle, you are to lay aside the old self corrupted by its deceitful desires, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self or put on the new man, Created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Who was created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness? In the garden. Adam. So what the first Adam lost, the last Adam restores. Because this is a direct reference of being created in the image of God. Referring to Adam and Eve. God's saying, I'm going to bring you back to that state of holiness and righteousness. So, from all these verses, I'm going to give you four things that I want you to write down to always remember this message. Number one, Hashem beautifies his people with priestly garments. 
Because that's what the Bible told us in the Torah and the Prophets. Hashem beautifies His people with priestly garments. The second thing we can see is, Hashem gives us beauty for ashes and praise. Oh, that is supposed to change there. This is supposed to say, instead of mourning. So I, I forgot to change out that word. I was copying and pasting. Forgive me. Uh, in your outline today, <laughs> Hashem gives us beauty for ashes and praise instead of mourning. Morning. So when we realize that God brought Israel out of Egypt and adorned her like a kingdom of priests to be a royal priesthood, he gave them priestly garments, if you will, to represent his glory on their life. When they went into exile, though, that was the time of sackcloth and ashes. So God says, don't worry, I'm going to bring you out of that. I'm going to give you beauty for your ashes, literally a head garment, uh, a, a, a turban for your head instead of ashes for your head, and I'll give you praise instead of mourning. Now, number three, Hashem removes our stained garments of sin and iniquity. This is what God did for Joshua the high priest. He says, take off those stained garments, remove those. I've removed that from you because when our garments get stained, he says, I'm going to remove those garments from you. And what we need to do and what we've learned from the Breed Hadashah is that Hashem clothes us with Messiah when we put off the old self and put on the new man. Today, if you will allow Messiah to reclothe you, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. You, if you don't realize it now, you'll think today how there are some things from your old life you put back on. I don't know if you've ever tried to get rid of clothes out of your closet. But you know that thing that, you know, like that, that, that shirt that my wife takes out of the closet like nine times and I keep bringing it back in the house. <laughs> my daughter takes that toy, you know, from, from the garage and we hid away because that was her two-year-old toy and Eliana wants to bring it back in so her other dolls can play with the younger dolls, right? You know? and, and sometimes we don't realize we keep putting stuff away and we keep bringing it back. And we keep putting stuff away and we keep bringing it back. Stop bringing it back. Stop putting on something that doesn't fit you or is no longer in style. And start putting on Messiah, because Messiah is always in style. Amen? Amen. Let me receive this message today. God's going to give us beauty for ashes. And this week you have a lot to look forward to in your six days of morning manna. We can look at the concept of Shabbat uh, starting tomorrow. Uh, on Monday, the tablets of the Torah, like the tablets of our heart. Uh, on day three, the presence of the Lord. Uh, day four, favor, grace in our life. Day five, God's com compassion. He's compassionate. He shows grace. Um, um, or actually even mercy. And number six, covenant. And then on day seven, my message is going to be titled, Show Me Your Glory. Show Me Your Glory. So let's stand to our feet today. If you receive this message, give God a big praise today. Remember, I don't want to see anybody wearing any more garments of depression or sadness. <laughs> Let's be glad in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Amen. Stretch your hands for the blessing. Thank you, Lord. Number 6, 24 through 26, Aaron would stretch his hands to bless all of the house of Israel. I do the same, creating the name Shaddai from the letter Sheen with my hands today to symbolically place the name of God upon your life today as it says in number 627. <speaking in Hebrew> May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you, shine his face upon you, be gracious to you, lift up his countenance upon you, and give you perfect peace, and star shalom, the Prince of Peace. In the name of the anointed Messiah, today we pray. In his name we pray a blessing over all of our lives. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen. God bless you today. Amen.
是。